AI and design. Um, we do talks about the intersection of AI and design. Uh, we get AI technologists talking about their perspectives on design and vice versa. Um, so thank you all for coming out on this rainy night to join us. Uh, please help yourself to snacks. I really don't want to take any home. So please, please eat more. <laughs> Um, uh, things I want to say are if, uh, shout out for speakers, if anyone in the audience knows uh, speakers who would be interested in speaking, I would love to talk with you. Um, we are actively looking to book our next meetup, we will probably be in, um, well, I don't know when it will be, but uh, if you know anyone who is interested in speaking, please talk to me and uh, I'll be in touch with them. Um, Two, uh, this is still a fairly young meetup, uh, and uh, we're still playing around with the format, so uh, we really welcome feedback. Um, if you have suggestions or things that you want to see, um, really uh, excited to hear it for that. Um, I think that's it. And bathrooms, uh, if you haven't found them, are outside. The woman's bathroom is uh, straight ahead, I believe. Actually, I'll let you talk. I'll let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have a great, we have a, a great talk tonight, um, and, uh, but before we get started with that, I uh, just want to turn it over to Solomon uh, to talk about the CSE a little bit. Okay. Uh, so just a quick introduction about myself. Light. Um, I am a Solomon Flax, I'm the events lead here at CIC, the Cambridge Innovation Center, and just a couple quick things about like who we are and like what space you're in. Uh, we are a global community of vibrant entrepreneurial hubs that aim to foster innovation of all kinds. Uh, while that's the very high level uh, the explanation of what we do, uh, on the more granular scale, we are a co-working space and we enable uh, the clients who rent our office space to build their business uh, better and faster through offering uh, world-class infrastructure, attentive hospitality, uh, flexible office space, um, and by hosting awesome events like this one that you're at. Uh, we truly believe that you can achieve more uh, through collaboration than in isolation. Uh, I also try to uh, gear these pitches to give you a sense of what other cool events might be going on that the audience might be interested in. And so through uh, Kevin's help, uh, we are hosting a deep learning and production meetup, uh, an action design meetup, an AR VR meetup, and a C++ meetup in the coming weeks. And if you'd like to learn more about what these events are and other cool events that are happening in our spaces, uh, please feel free to visit CIC.com and go to the events page. I uh, hope to see you all at future events. My email is on the board there if you want to have any questions about hosting an event here or just want to connect with our community in general. Um, bathrooms are straight down that hall for the women's uh, restroom. And for the men's, you kind of do a U, go through, go down the hall, go through the elevator lobby, and take another right. And that's it. We'll see you all at future events. Thanks so much. Cool. Thanks, Solomon. Uh, with that, we're going to get started. Um, I am very excited to introduce uh, Brennan White. Uh, he is the founder of the leading AI storytelling platform, Cortex. Brennan's worked with global enterprises worldwide to introduce AI technology and AI-supported processes into their creative business units for four years. Prior to that, Brennan worked as a creative at the digital agency he founded that has been on the Inc. 5000 several years in a row. Without further ado, get your hands together for Brennan. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you for having us. This is a cool opportunity. We, uh, Cortex, John and I are from Cortex. We, Office is literally two blocks away, but I was unaware of meetups like this. Almost never set foot in CIC, so this is really cool. We're just joking about how we're going to be coming to all these events that they talked about, public speaking, stuff like that, that we, we all need to work on. So um, so thanks for having us. Um, so I am uh, not a technologist by background. I started a digital marketing agency, as you heard, uh, and then Cortex, which is an AI software that helps creatives. We support creatives. Do, you know, throughout their work. Um, so just to give you a concept of where my opinions come from, I'm mostly the business guy. I raise money, I do sales, I hire people. We have a technology team, obviously, uh, but that's not me. But I'm pretty, as you'll see, I'm pretty conversant in the technology. Um, so when I talk to events, usually it's about AI and the intersection of AI and creativity. So I had no idea a cool event like this, kind of like so overlapping of what we always talk about was nearby, so this is pretty cool. Um, and I think creativity is a pretty cool topic when you think about AI. Just a few years ago, right, when we started three and a half years ago, trying to take, uh, have a conversation with anyone 
about AI and creativity was really tough because the kind of traditional story, which you'll still hear sometimes, is that you know a lot of jobs or a lot of things uh, lend themselves to being impacted by AI, but creativity is like the human domain, right? That's what we, we've been in charge of traditionally. Um, so oftentimes people think of it as something that either uh, doesn't lend itself to be helped by AI, shouldn't be impacted, or can't be impacted. Uh, but as we'll see today, not only is it being impacted now in pretty interesting ways, but also I think that is extremely valuable and creatives should want that to happen. Um, I am a creative myself. I went to school for music. John went to Berkeley for music. We're, we're creatives ourselves. My, my co-founder, Matt, is not here tonight. Creative writing major, right? We all actually, a lot of us are creatives and we're very passionate about this topic. Um, in fact, might as well, since small room, any creative background or professional people here? A couple, all right. So majority technologists, I'm assuming, uh, but maybe a, a handful. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll be addressing you guys kind of directly as well. Um, the cool thing about creativity, and the reason I think, one of the reasons I think, it's a really awesome opportunity for the applying AI, is A, it's huge, right? Creativity has kind of woven its way into everything humans do, right? So just looking in the business world, right? Strategy, market research, planning, coming up with ideas, obviously is kind of inherently creative. The entertainment industry, obviously, again, a no-brainer, very, very, almost purely creative. But even things kind of more boring and more uh, traditional on the business side, marketing, advertising, product design, packaging, all of that, super creative, right? Even you might say primarily creative in the day-to-day -day work. Um, so it's a big opportunity. It affects a lot of people. Um, yet, as I talked about, people don't, or haven't traditionally until recently, started combining those two parts of the world and started asking, you know, what does AI have to give to creative people to affect their jobs, to improve their lives, and vice versa. Um, and so um, we're going to talk about that today. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, there's a few creatives in the, in the, in the world here, in the room. Um, if they're anything like me, when I went to school for a cre creative job, at least, or so I thought, um, uh, the way I envisioned my life was that I would be you know, synthesizing, I'd be like checking out, you know, I was a music major, checking out music, the latest things that people have done, kind of understanding what the trends are, you know, listening to the best stuff, um, coming up with my own things, maybe taking two genres that hadn't been done and combined before, combining them, that kind of thing. Um, and I thought I'd be doing this in a very kind of artsy, manual way, you know, a coffee shop, you know, in my backyard, or something like that, right? Um, but for those of you who are actually doing creative work now, you'll recognize that your jobs probably don't recognize, resemble what I just described, right? That you're probably not just kind of leisurely hanging out at a coffee shop. You're probably hustling. You're probably doing a lot of things that resemble work, right? That oftentimes might even resemble repetitive work, things that are not so rewarding or intellectually challenging. The thing I always like to say is we kind of thought we were going to be you know, the Don Drapers of the world, the creatives of the world, where you can kind of sit around and have that one big idea every once in a while and get paid for it and have a cool experience. And it turns out it ends up being lots and lots and lots of frustratingly small and competitive and oftentimes not that rewarding work. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and I'm going to go into the reasons why creative work today is not what we think it is and not what it used to be. And then we'll talk about, right after that, how AI is changing that and hopefully giving us some of that vision, how creative work used to be, back, right? Giving that, making that job more experienced. Um, so here's the, I'm going to share with you guys some data about the problem. Um, this data that we're going to talk about is specifically um, creative work done by businesses, like creative content, because it's an easy stat to get but I think it actually correlates perfectly with the larger creative world and the work around creative stuff. Um, and, uh, and it's just that this so happens to be a much easier stat to get. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a shadow of the larger piece that's out there. So if you think about business creative, right? Every business has to tell its story. It has to make pieces of content, whether that's a marketing advertisement or a Super Bowl ad or you know, so a tweet even, right? They have to make these things to tell their story, to get their customers to come buy their product, to spread their messages around. And every company, whether they think of it that way or not, is telling 
stories, right? And so if you look at the, 19, the late 1960s, the early 70s, the average company was creating about 50 finalized pieces of creative in a year. Meaning, you know, back then there was only a few television channels, a few radio stations, things like that. There wasn't too many other viable channels, you know, print, billboards, that's about it, right? For, for a company to really tell its story at a large level, right? So if you were a creative, somebody, a marketer, advertiser, some sort of business communicator at these companies, in the 60s, your team, however large it might have been, was on average responsible for a few dozen pieces of content in a year, right? But if you fast forward to the late 90s, not only did those channels get more sophisticated, and you know you got you went from three television channels total to hundreds, and you went from you know, a handful of magazines total to hundreds or thousands, right? And you have now had to create content for various things, but also, of course, the internet kind of hit us in the face, right? So if you're uh, if you kind of look at the generations of the same kind of job, if you were the the marketing Don Draper folks in the 60s, your workload maybe 5x to you know, two couple hundred in the 90s, right? You had to not only create more content for the old channels, but also protect those new channels, spread the word, and get your word out there. What do you guys think is the current number of pieces of content that a brand creates in a year now? Any guesses? 1,000. Good guess. It's actually 14,000. But that's very close. <laughs> very, very close, actually. A lot of people under, uh, under, under guess it, so you were very good. Um, but these numbers are actually to scale. Um, so there's these, sorry, these dots, excuse me, are actually to scale. So as you can tell, this dot, the workload for all of us creatives just left the page just in the past 20 years or so, right? And so when you think about, okay, why is the creative work now, why is it so different than what we thought creative work was gonna be? In, what creative work was depicted as back in the day, you know, the Mad Men television show, things like that. It's because not only do the communication channels or the, the ways that communication, excuse me, creative jobs uh, have to work, do, are not only are they increasing, there are more channels, but each channel is becoming more complex. So what's happened in this time frame? Of course, the internet has matured, we've added mobile, we've added social media, we've added all these types of channels, right? So, and businesses could, you know, they haven't stopped doing television advertising, they haven't stopped doing all this creative. And when you think of things like, you know, when you take this out of business communicators, you think about the larger creative world, right? Netflix, right? Look at Hulu, look at uh, Amazon Prime. We just saw that Netflix just borrowed two billion more dollars of debt the other day, it came out yesterday, I think, to buy more shows and do more content, right? To appease all of us, right? So. Uh, the workload for all creatives has left the building, right? It's not a, it's not a human level of work anymore. Uh, if you kind of are familiar with marketers like I am, you'll know that in the past 20 years, this is about 100x, right? But they haven't 100x their head of, of the marketing team. Like you guys all work at various places, right? Your marketing team hasn't 100x in the past 10, 15 years, right? Their budget certainly hasn't 100x in the past 15 years, but their workload has. So that's why creative work, broadly, feels like a sweatshop these days. It feels unrewarding. It feels like your, uh, the amount of work you're required to do is beyond human scale. Um, or put another way, uh, if you guys recognize this guy, Don Draper from Mad Men, there's no amount of scotch and thinking <laughs> that can get the work done anymore. Right? Back in the day, sure, you have 50 pieces of content to make in a year, you can put some people in a room, you can think about it really hard, and you can get it done. That doesn't work anymore at all. Right? So ironically, when you think about you know, how do we get, or and I guess put another way, um, that number uh, divided by the number of work days in a year, it's about 50 finalized pieces of content per day, right? So we're at a right, Don Draper year of work per day is what's required now. So how do we get to a world where we can have like that human interaction again? You know, you can talk to your coworkers and synthesize cool ideas and, and have a human level of work when it comes to creative again. And ironically, I think the answer is you use technology, you use AI and machine learning to help you to support the creatives in various little ways so that the work becomes more human again, right? Um, and we'll go to so the next section. I'm going to take you guys through uh, little pieces of machine learning, uh, use cases where people are applying machine learning to creative things uh, that are getting increasingly, increasingly more complex as we go. 
Um, and uh, and, you'll, and we're going to end with some kind of full-fledged examples. Um, part of your drinking. Um, so you guys, <laughs> so you guys are familiar, uh, many of you I'm sure, with uh, machine vision, right? Machine vision, as we know, like kind of just in the past few years became a commodity, basically, right? The, at least the ability to notice things like, you know, this is a rock and this is a woman and this is a palm tree, uh, even specific brands, uh, facial ex uh, expressions, uh, famous locations, uh, all of that is extremely doable, very easy, available via API for very cheap these days, right? Back in the day, that was a whole job, right? You'd have to kind of recognize things in photos and then start to piece them together and build that good idea. Now, we can do this, of course, not only well, uh, better than a lot of humans, but also at a ridiculous scale for a really affordable uh, time. Here's an example. I, I forget exactly where. If someone recognizes it, please let me know where. But Stanford. Stanford. Oh, well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I was going to say Stanford, well, I'm sure. But um, as you can tell, kind of just by looking at it, I'm sure you guys are smart people. Uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night, picture of a building. They were able to combine those two into something that's uh, new, right? That's kind of what we just talked about, right? What you, when you maybe imagine yourself in a creative job, you know, listening to Kanye, listening to Dead Mouse saying, what would that sound like if I combine the two, right? This is what's happening, and it's not do, being done by a human, right? This is done by software. Um, and so that's cool, right? And again, we're getting a little bit more complex as we go. This is, again, by itself, not really replacing anyone's job, not really changing the world, but um, we'll see how these things combine. Oh, I'm gonna not tease this one first, I'm gonna explain it first. Um, this one's pretty funny. Um, someone might know where this is from too, so. I'll, I'll rely on you guys, I don't remember exactly where, uh, but a group gave, uh, I think it was 10,000 um, uh, romance novels to an AI to read. Basically to get the tone of voice and the words and the kind of layout of how romance novels talk. And then they also combine that with machine vision, like we just talked about, to be able to kind of understand what's in an image and try to write a caption for that image in the style of a romance novel. So that, I'll read it to you so you don't have to be an eye test here, but this was the image, which as we all know as sumo wrestlers, right? Um, and this is the, I'll read this uh, caption that they wrote. He was a shirtless man in the back of his mind, and I let out a curse as he leaned over <laughs> to kiss me on the shoulder. He wanted to strangle me, considering the beautiful boy I'd become wearing his boxers. <laughs> now, this is, that's bananas, right? That doesn't make any sense, really. But, a few things, right? A, you can kind of see where this is kind of describing the photo a little bit, right? right? If you were doing uh, ro romance novel style, it's not doing too poorly at describing the photo. It's certainly not there. You certainly would have put this on your brand's page. You wouldn't let it write, you know, look at your brand's brand voice and write your content, but we're getting there, right? Uh, of course, it's it's got the grammar, right? Which I guess is the easy part, right? It's got the tone, right? although we probably aren't all big romance novel guys, you can kind of see how that sounds like a romance novel. It is kind of describing what might be happening. I think we all know a little bit better. But, um, so that's, a, that's an interesting little use case, right? And that's yet another thing that you know, was only human. Humans were the only kind of people who could, you could say, you know, as a music major, we used to get assignments like this. You'd study Bach, then say, okay, compose something in counterpoint, go, right? This, this is exactly what this AI just accomplished. It, write something like that in the style of a romance novel, right? Um, so again, by itself, maybe not life-changing, maybe not replacing anyone's job, maybe not making anyone's job easier, but we move on. So this one's actually from our company, so this is a little bit more complex. One of our customers is in the hospitality industry. They wanted to, we give these kind of reports called visual vocabulary reports, which is we use unsupervised learning to look at all the imagery that an entire industry uses in all their communications. So in this case, it's the hospitality industry. Uh, and we can compare that uh, trends and, and clusters of that content with performance against marketing metrics. So in this case, we were able to prove to them that in their entire industry, uh, information about imagery, about their chefs performed 47 or 43 percent lower than an average piece of content that they put out. So, if you're a, a hospitality company, especially a luxury hospitality company like our client, they spend a lot of money on their chefs. They spend a lot of money talking about their chefs. They spend a lot of money partnering with fa famous chefs and influencers about food. Uh, this was a great 
proof point, right? This was a great way to say, you know what, maybe let's change that strategy. But that alone, you know, chefs, you guys can kind of understand how machine vision could be taught, what a chef looks like, you know, someone wearing white, you know, working with a bowl, that kind of thing. That's not super complex. So this next one's a little bit more complex. Um, again, this is unsupervised learning, so it's not that one of us or somebody on our team or even on our client's team told the software to, to analyze chefs. It's that it was told to analyze, analyze content, and it actually came back with the categories and the signal differences. So in this case, this one is really interesting because you'll notice these are all pictures of breakfast with a view, right? And so it's not just food on a table, it's not just breakfast, it's breakfast on a table with, you know, Eiffel Tower in the background or ocean in the background or city skyline in the background, right? And that's something that, you know, I'll be honest, almost two decades in marketing, decade and a half, I would have never tested breakfast with you, right? If you left it up to me, I would not make that a category, but as you can see, there's actually a serious signal there, right? This is a company that reaches millions and millions of people with every single post, or hundreds of thousands of people with every post, and millions of people over, over a week. 21% lift in what they're, who they're reaching and people they're reaching is very significant. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of extra people uh, just over you know, a short period of time. Um, so again, that's a you know slightly more complex. Again, you're not necessarily, question? Sure. Uh, is that saying that breakfast with a view is impacting the number of people that engage with this post or actually, like what, what is that signal actually saying? So this number is against their objective, their kind of marketing metric, which for them is engagements on social media. Okay. So, so this is breakfast with a view content, anything kind of featuring that, gets 21% more engagements okay. on social media than their average type of content, okay. right? Um, sorry, I didn't explain that. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and there's you know an entire report with all these things by channel, all that's good stuff, but this is, uh, Another interesting example, combining a couple of those pieces that we just saw into something that's now business useful, right? We're not really replacing a job here, but we are amplifying creatives jobs, right? Before they would rack their brains and guess and then get, get fired or get in trouble when something didn't work out. Now we're able to say, let's stress out a little bit less. We've solved some, we've kind of given you some good ideas. Now you can go be creative in a specific way, figure out how to do breakfast with a view interesting and more better than anyone else, more better, <laughs> better than anyone else. Um, so this next one, again, small piece of technology, something that we use internally all the time. Um, one of the things when talking to our customers that takes all their time, a lot of their time, is finding the right images and video, right? So for a company, you know, a big company like Marriott or Jack Daniels or a kind of huge global company, um, You'd think, you know, you'd be right, but you'd think they have a lot of content, and they do. So the content, the problem isn't necessarily finding the content to post, it's finding the right content to post, right? So they might have 10,000 images per database, and they might have access to several databases. So for them, just as big a problem is selecting the correct opportunity. So what often happens is they'll have something in mind, like this post was actually a real example for one of our customers. Uh, this was the seed of their idea, but they'd already used this post before. It did well, they wanted to find something just like it. They had access to a stock image partner that has 250 million images, right? And so, of course, you could, you could go through search, you could say like, you know, guy and girl water, or like family and splashing, or right? You could try to keyword that, uh, but it's not very efficient. And they self-reported, spend 10 to 15 minutes doing that per post. And again, they're doing 50 of these posts a day. So that ends up adding up to a lot of their time. Perfect use case for machine learning, right? You can vector this image, catch, you know, not lose a lot of information, and then find imagery that feels the same. Because as we just saw, right, the example I just gave, keyword search is great when you have just like an image of a cat or an image of an object, right? And you've seen another image of that same object. However, in real creative use cases, right, in a song or in uh, business communication, it's not just, you know, does this cat, you know, this photo of a cat in it, it's does this photo feel like my brand? Does this photo feel right? And you know, as you can see here, these feel very similar, right? Fun, light, exciting, right, whatever. Stuff that's really hard to put in a keyword search, right? It's not just searching for objects. It this returns this in seconds, which is a photo very similar with a very similar 
Um, here's another example. I'm, again, we can go through a few more examples, and then we'll get to the end, which is kind of pulling it all together to see the impact on some companies. Um, this is an example where uh, this customer here, a hotel in Miami, an individual hotel, has a very complex sentence, which you don't really need to read, but what's worth noticing is there's talking about a pool, it's talking about a boardwalk, it's talking about dinner, it's talking about stars, it's given the name of a proper noun of a restaurant. Um, so how, uh, as a human, if you read this, you'd understand that it's actually talking about the boardwalk. That sentence is trying to get you to think of a boardwalk, and a human marketer would know that. But again, not easy to do, just given regular keyword searching, um, but again, we've, we've this, technology we've built, but um, we build an ad that kind of understands the intent of the sentence and can apply that to databases of imagery to pull the right image, which in this case, since it was from their actual database, this is the photo of the boardwalk they were writing about, right? So again, taking those 10, 15 minutes a day that makes their life feel like drudgery where they're constantly pecking away to find the right photo that the photographer took and didn't label correctly, right? Boom, uh, give that time back, support them, make their life more uh, more valuable. Um, so what we're talking about here is combining a few things, right? Data, right? Which in this case, you know, in the creative job, per job that of course varies quite a bit, but in the jobs we've been focusing on for these examples are mostly photos and videos and text. Um, machine learning, as we just saw, it's not really one algorithm, right? It's not one magical solution. It's lots of little valuable things that kind of do one or two things that humans do naturally. We all kind of do those things okay. Right? But it sucks to do them 50, 70, 100 times a day. Um, and then automation. So rather than, you know, in the example we just gave over here, uh, okay, it found your photo. Does it just give it back to you, right? And say, okay, now I have this photo, and I have to walk over here and create this post. Or does it maybe schedule that post for the channel in question and give you ideas of what to write about in the caption or what links to link to? Right? Does it kind of save some of the time by automating intelligently, by kind of combining several of the steps into one. So that's what we do. So you know that's why we're so passionate about it, is because A, my first company that I started 12 years ago, we were the ones with this problem, right? I started a digital marketing agency that had this problem day in and day out for big brands over many, many years. Then we started Cortex, which is the solution for that. Um, so as, a, as in closing, uh, I will show you guys a few examples. Uh, different examples of different companies with kind of like business outcome numbers, just because that's important. Um, but the thing that we're most, I think, proud of, you know, as creatives, as people who care about creatives having good, you know, happy lives and good jobs, um, everything we're going to show you, we increase the marketing metrics, the business metrics of the company, but without increasing the workload or the number of people on the team or the budget of the team. So we're actually making these people's lives better, as we've been talking about, and securing their jobs a little bit more uh, by allowing them to go to their boss and say, you know, hey, we've, these numbers have been going up in the quarter, we're crushing it, and you know, we don't need to hire more people, we don't need to give people more work, right? We're uh, making people's lives better. So um, there's a couple of slides in here in between that I'll just show you that are, uh, kind of tell you how we do that. Um, this is Cortex, this is our software, one of the views. This is actually combining kind of all the pieces of machine learning we just looked about and more into a fully AI generated plan. So this is a calendar. You guys are familiar with calendars. Marketers use calendars all the time to organize teams and plan what they're gonna talk about, right? This entire thing was designed by our software. No human in involvement at all. Saves them all the time of looking at competitors, looking at their past performance, deciding when and where to post how often to post, what to post about, even down to selecting and suggesting specific photos. Here's a view of that. It, uh, we have a partner with Getty Images, which is one of the biggest stock image providers in the world. It knows what it wants to talk about. It knows what your brand can talk about. It knows what colors work. It knows what keywords work. It suggests a photo and it gets it ready just to be ready to publish. So all the steps we talked about, all the things that made our clients' lives frustrating, right? Looking at competitor data, gathering data, putting in a spreadsheet, Right? Building a calendar and I'm post this this day. All the stuff that made their lives drudgery, we got rid of, right? Because we're kind of building this AI human team that makes their lives better. Um, so the examples. Um, I'll quickly pass through these. We can talk to them in more detail after, you know, it's like we 
don't need to hear about these in too much detail, uh, but small e-commerce company, uh, traffic to the website is kind of a thing, right? They need more people to come buy their product as a jewelry company. They only sell jewelry e-commerce and they only do it from social media. 85% um, increase in size visits with the same team, same budget, and returning those users all that time back. So we made their lives better and we made their jobs more secure, right? So that's a win that John and I can be proud of. Um, this is a, I don't know why it says travel government, uh, but basically it's a, a government um, tourism board. Um, huge increase in impression, more than double people seeing their message. Um, this, this metric is actually pretty cool if you guys think about it. They pay photographers and they spend their own time to make content, right? So a piece of content, like a photo, costs them money or time or, or, or dollars. 600% increase ish in the interactions per piece of content means each piece of content that they made after using Cortex was more effective, right? Got in front of more people, got them to take more action, things like that. And a 16 times, 16x increase in site visits, which is huge. And then big global brand, a very interesting brand, <laughs> um, <laughs> customer of ours, right? Reaching millions and millions of people, um, increased their engagements by 40% in 90 days, which uh, for them, right, over a million person audience, that's pretty huge. Um, and again, we don't have to. Don't belabor this point. We can talk about them after over Doritos if you want. Um, but <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. So um, feel free if you guys want to learn more. We're going to stick around. Uh, we are literally two blocks away. Come by, have beers. We've got alcohol with us. Anytime you want. <laughs> Open invitation. Uh, and thanks for listening. <laughs>